I'm Dave Stokes. I am a community manager for, for MySkill products. Um, work for Oracle. If you need to get a hold of me, uh, there's my email address and my Twitter handle. And I'm very glad to be back at Open Source 101 talking today about MySkill indexes, histograms, and other ways to speed up your queries. I uh, want to warn you, uh, time limit here so they won't see a lot of the uh, other ways to speed up your queries, but I'll give you a pointer on how to get to that later. Uh, first thing I have to do is give you the Oracle Safe Harbor Agreement. The idea here is that if I talk about something, a uh, future product, I don't have perfect knowledge of it, so you can't hold me accountable for it. Uh, if I, uh, I'm not talk, planning to talk anything on the future releases, but I might get off on a tangent during Q&A. Now everything I'm talking about today is in the community edition of MySQL, which is free. Uh, source code is out there. Uh, it's for all the operating systems out there. You can download it from MySQL.com. And uh, a lot of this also pertains to the Enterprise Edition, which is a superset of what you get here, but you have to buy a subscription to get that. Okay, those of you running MySQL 5.6, um, it reached end of life back in February. And I'm sorry about that, but it had its day and it is now over. If you're running 5.6, please upgrade to 5.7 or better yet to 8.0. You'll see a lot of neat features in 8.0 today. So, by the way, if you want to try the MySQL data service, this is Oracle uh, MySQL in the cloud, uh, you can get $300 in credits, which can last a long time if you keep the smaller storage engines. Uh, test dive for free, uh, $300 in credit if you go out to oracle.com slash cloud slash free. Uh, very exciting service. A lot of new things you're going to hear announcements about in the next couple of weeks uh, that are really, really neat, but unfortunately I can't talk about them uh, because I'm prohibited by my bosses. But $300 does go a long way. Give us a try. Okay, what is this session about? Well, no one ever complains that the database is too fast. Well, very rarely. So we're going to talk today about speeding up queries, and it is not a dark art. Uh, a lot of things you see on the internet, uh, if you go out to the various help me sites on the web, make it look like it's a uh, mysterious Harry Potterish dark art. Well, it's not. It's it's all engineering, and the trouble is you have to have an understanding of how to speed things up, and people treat that as magic, and it's really not. So today we're going to look at the proper uses of indexes, histograms, locking options, and some other ways to speed queries up. And I want to warn you, this is a dry subject. How dry? We're talking Arizona late October dry. Um, uh, lots of text on the screen. Uh, by the way, I recommend that you go out to uh, slideshare.net slash, that should be Dave Stokes, not David M. Stokes. I'm sorry there, it's better. It's, uh, at the end of it, you'll see that I have it corrected. I'll have to go back and change that. Anyway, go down and look at the slides and uh, that will help you uh, use them as a reference. Uh, don't try to absorb all this information at once. There's much, much, much to try to get it to your skull if you haven't done that. And unfortunately today, we're talking, talking about system configuration. We're not talking about the configuration of MySQL, your hardware, your networking. Uh, but by the way, the slides are posted to uh, Dave Stokes. It's correct down here. Uh, once again, this is a dry subject. If you can't get it all, come back to it later. Uh, it's going to be easier. Also, something you're not covering today is normalizing your data. Uh, you can't build a skyscraper on a found, foundation of sand. Um, recommend using the third normal form or better. If you don't know what that is, uh, please go out there and look that up there. The idea is to have minimal redundancies in your data. Uh, also think about how you're going to use your data. Uh, if you're making um, popcorn, you don't want to serve people raw kernels usually. Um, don't use a fork to eat soup. You, how you consume your data is, is very important. By the way, bad normalization will hurt your performance of your queries. Uh, no matter how much training you give it a docs, it will not be faster than a thoroughbred racehorse. So the heart of what we're looking at today is the optimizer. It's kind of the brain and nervous system. It takes a look at your query and determines the best way to run everything. And most relational databases these days do have uh, an elaborate query optimization system. And according to Wikipedia, the optimizer attempts to determine the most efficient way to get your data. We'll talk about efficiency in a second. One of the hardest problems in query optimization is to accurately estimate the cost of alternative query plans. Uh, everyone uses a cost-based optimizer where the cost is actually measured in disk reads. Disk is 100,000 times, 100, times slower than reading it out of memory. And since that was the worst case, that's how the mathematical model came up. That's beginning to change. You're going to see a lot of stuff in the next five, ten years over as people store stuff on various types of media, uh, how to get that information back to you. Now, cardinality, or how unique the data is in a column, 
also helps. So the more cardinality you have, uh, the more uniqueness you have in a com, the better. Now, the query optimizer evaluates the various options. Uh, once again, it wants to get it in the cheapest way. And it's kind of like a GPS. Uh, if I was going to go to lunch today, I turn left out of the driveway, right at the stop sign, right go over the railroad tracks, and my favorite restaurant's off on the left. Well, like a GPS, um, the optimizer's historical information may not be always optimal. Uh, for instance, I may not know that my neighbors blocked my driveway or that there's a train crossed across the railroad track or if the restaurant's actually moved or closed on today. So what this final determination comes from the optimizer is evaluates other things. It's called a query plan. We'll see how to generate one of those. Also, um, unfortunately not today, I can't talk about optimizer hints because I'm time limited. But there are other ways to uh, talk the optimizer into doing things your way. So if your query has five joins, just for the joins, joins alone, that's um, five factorial or 120 different ways of assembling everything to get it all together. Uh, as you can see, this gets very complex. It's actually more complex than a lot of stuff you see in operating systems. Now, the main way you're going to look at the query plan is using explain. And you explain, explain takes a great deal of explanation and probably a good one week or two week class, but I don't have time for that today. Now, the syntax is fairly simple. I uh, pre-plan explain in front of your, your query, and you'll see the examples of this, and it will tell you uh, what the optimizer wants to do. Now, of course, it's just not that simple. There's all types of explains we have. Explain, uh, explain with different formats, uh, JSON or tree, explain and analyze, which is very valuable to that, and visual explain. Now, here's a simple explain example. We have a query. Select star, which is the wild card for all columns, from the table city, where the country code is equal to GBR. Uh, by the way, the slash capital G gives you things in a vertical format instead of the tabular format. So there's our query. These are the details. And I uh, won't go into the details right now, but I, I want to show you where they pop up. And this is the actual query plan. This is what would get executed by the system. It's going to be re rewritten from this to this here, where it actually puts in the schema or database name uh, for all the, the uh, columns it pulls out. Now, this does not seem like a, a big thing for the first time you see it, but it will become uh, more important a little bit later. Now, Visual Explain, you can get from MySQL Workbench. And it gives you the same information, but a little bit more, uh, uh, in a better formatted way for, for most people who are just starting out. Tell us where we're getting our data, the various costs. The cost of this query is 73.72, uh, how many rows we're going to have to read. Now, slightly different query, um, explain format equals tree. It tells us that uh, this one, we're selecting star from city. We're joining it to the country table. Uh, where the city population is equal to co country population. And it's going to tell us that we're doing an inner hash join, much faster than our normal uh, branch and loop. And it gives us some more uh, information on what's going on in the cost and the number of rows that have to be read. Uh, go to format equals JSON, you get a lot more information. Uh, for most of you starting out with query uh, planning, uh, this is overkill. Uh, eventually you'll work up into this. Now, Explain Analyze came out a little bit over a year ago with MySQL 8018. Uh, the previous explains were from uh, the details you saw came from statistical information. Explain Analyze actually goes out and runs the query. It gives you the actual time it takes to run the query and the actual performance. By the way, if you uh, get a big difference between the two in Explain Analyze and regular Explain, uh, please run Analyze table to update the stats. So. More on using explain a little bit later. So indexes, what is that index? Well, according to Wikipedia, a database index is a data structure that improves the speed of data retrieval. Uh, think of it as a mini table that's cut down to just the point of position on disk or memory where the data is and the, uh, the field that you're indexing on. And uh, I like to say it's a table with a shortcut uh, to another table or a model of some of your data in another table. Now, the important thing about this, the more tables you have, the more indexes you have, the more your memory f um, fills up, and also indexes have overhead that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so the more you do, the more you could be cutting off your, uh, your supply of memory. Now, there's many types of indexes. 
Uh, if you look at the syntax, um, create unique, full text, spatial, and then uh, you're creating the index, you, get, you can name the index and all the various options for that. Now, MySQL uses what they call a clustered index. Uh, the table storage is organized on the values of the primary key. Uh, by the way, you want a primary key. We'll go into that more. Uh, for best performance, choose the primary key columns carefully based on the most performance critical queries. Uh, if you're, once again, if you're selling popcorn, you don't want to have it on the actual seed, you want to want it on the actual popcorn. Uh, by the way, modifying these columns of a clustered index is very expensive, so changing your primary can get uh, pretty nasty. If you're an Oracle DBA, uh, you probably know this is an indexed oriented organized table. So uh, here's our index. Uh, here's our, our data index is kind of, I think, is the stub tree into the bigger data here. Now, secondary indexes are on a separate index. They're actually something that points to the primary index. So it kind of piggybacks, everything piggybacks on the primary index. Now, creating a table with a primary key is very simple. Uh, here we're creating a table called T1. We have three columns, C1, 2, and 3. C1 and integer, not null, we'll talk about null later. Auto increment, which means every time you insert a record, it will increment that value before it writes it. And we tell the the, uh, the database server that this is our primary key, this is the way you're gonna organize the data. Now, an index is a list of keys. So keys form up indexes. Unfortunately, we use those interchangeably in the MySQL world. And you'll hear them used interchangeably. Uh, you'll have to get used to it. Now, the primary key is a key for an index that uniquely defined for a row, and it should be immutable, something that you're never really gonna go out and change. Uh, once again, NODB needs a primary key to organize the data. Uh, if you don't pick one, uh, it will pick one for you, and it's almost guaranteed to be the one you don't want. Uh, please don't use null values. We'll talk about that later. And by the way, you want this monotonically increasing, one, two, three, four. Uh, if you have to use UUIDs, which do not monotonically increase, uh, please use the UUID to bin function. Otherwise, uh, your performance will suffer. Uh, indexing on a prefix of a column is possible. Say like you um, have looked at your data and you could say that 98, 95% of your customers all have uh, unique, uh, the first 10 of their name is gonna be unique or close to unique or uh, fast enough for searching. You don't have to do the entire name. I see a lot of names out there as Varkar 50, uh, just index the first 10 characters. Uh, the smaller your index is, the faster they're gonna be able to be searched. Uh, you can have multi-column indexes. In this example, we have uh, in our table called test, we have the last name and first name. Our primary key is gonna be ID, but we can also index the last name, first name. Uh, like when I call my doctor, they want my last name, my date of birth, and that's how they look me up. So I'm sure that's a uh, multi-column index that they use. Make the uh, first one you index uh, the most unique that you can be, the highest cardinality. Uh, that's the way uh, it works better. That way you can search, in this case, just on last name. This index is good for searching on last name, first name together, or just last name. Does not work for first name. Also, if you have values, um, you have some complex uh, string uh, string and number combination, like a subassembly for, for some sort of car or something like that, uh, you can actually make a hash of the values and use that for an index. Other type of indexes you're going to hear about, unique indexes, that's where every field in the column is uni unique. I highly recommend that. Uh, full text searches, if you're searching through uh, strings, uh, you can do, set that up. Covering index, this is where all the information is actually uh, for your queries actually held in the index, so it doesn't actually dive into the data. Uh, for my example, it could be my last name, my zip code, and my my date of birth. And when I search for my name and zip code, it automatically pulls up my date of birth from the index. Uh, secondary indexes, as I mentioned earlier, is another column uh, for that's indexed, and it actually piggybacks to the pointer to the primary index. And spatial indexes, this is for geographical information. Uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, too much detail for right now. Functional indexes. You can actually make an index out of a function. Uh, in this example for right here, we have a table with column one and column two, and we're going to take the absolute value of column one uh, for 
a uh, for an index. Uh, there's other things you can do. Um, so like you act automatically, uh, someone wants to search for a, a product from you that's under two thousand uh, dollars. You can use this to round up to the you know to two thousand dollars and search for that. Uh, if you need to add forty percent for handling, um, you can do that. Also make it the sending. Multi-value indexes. If you're using the JSON data type, this became very, very important. Uh, traditionally, you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between what's in the index and what's in the table. Well, with JSON, we had arrays and arrays of arrays and uh, needed to come with multi-value indexes. So now you can have multiple indexes, multiple entries in the index for one row of data. Uh, very interesting, especially since we don't have a native array data type and people are using this for that sort of information. Also, we came with a new function, uh, member of, so uh, as you can see here, uh, we're looking for three, a member of this array here, and it returns a one saying, yes, that value is in that array. Now MySQL has two main types of index structures. Uh, the B tree is self-balancing. So like we're looking for value number uh, 47. Uh, we know that we go off this leaf here and it's gonna be somewhere in this information. Uh, we also have hashes, which are fairly new to MySQL and uh, much more efficient than our nested loop joins, but um, and it automatically happens for you, you don't have to do anything else, but they do take a little bit of understanding. You have to be using equi joins. Now, please keep in mind if there's a choice between multiple indexes, um, MySQL Optimizer will try to take the index of the smallest number of rows, um, the most selective index, uh, the highest cardinality, uh, well not the highest number of cardinality, but the smallest index. Uh, you can actually specify which indexes to use, uh, but we'll go into that later. Now, MySQL use indexes that columns more efficiently if they are declared as the same type and size. So if you're matching car and var car together, that's okay. Uh, but var car uh, 10 and var car 15, that's not gonna work. So try to uh, compare apples with apples and oranges with oranges. Null, uh, the null is kind of an interesting idea. Uh, in the early days of databases, you usually had one if something was true, zero if something was false. But how do you symbolize that you don't have that data? You don't know if it's true or false. So they came up with the idea of null. Well, great idea, implementation for databases is kind of horrendous. Uh, so null is used to designate a lack of data. And uh, this is an interesting graphic that kind of shows the difference between zero and null. Now, indexing null values is really not a good thing. Um, it's like you have everything else indexed but five nulls and the optimizer has to go through those five nulls separately to uh, find out the information. Not efficient. Uh, so don't index null values unless you absolutely have to. Invisible indexes. This is something that came out with 8.0 uh, three years ago and the original idea was that you're trying to optimize a query. So you have an index that you're not sure if it's useful or not so you check the queries and explain. You remove that index because it just doesn't feel right to you for some reason. You rerun explain. And about that time, you start getting phone calls, text screams uh, from power users about the slow query. So you realize that that index in question may not have had use for you, but it had, the rest of the world seems to need it. And you start to rebuild that index and it takes seconds, minutes, hours, days, whatever. Well, with invisible indexes, you doubt the usefulness of an index. You check the queries and explain. You make that index invisible. The optimizer cannot see that index for the entire server. Uh, that op the um, optimizer cannot see that index. Rerun explain. You start getting the, the screams. Uh, the power users are upset. You make that index visible and away you all go happily. And you can blame the problem on the network, JavaScript, GDPR, Slack, Cloud, whatever. Now, if you want, you can go out to SysSchema, which is one of our information, uh, uh, internal information with the servers, and it will give you reports of what queries are running without indexes and what indexes haven't been used for a while. Now, if you get indexes that haven't been used for a while, you're thinking get rid of them to save memory uh, or save overhead. Um, those are candidates for removal. Be careful. Uh, just because you're not using it or it's not being used today doesn't mean it's not used once a week, once a quarter, uh, hopefully not once a year. How to use invisible index? Very simple, alter table, T1, alter index, index name, invisible. Now the optimizer can't see it. Um, you need to turn it back on, just reverse it, and instead of invisible, put in the word visible. 
Now histograms. Histograms are an alternative to indexes in a lot of cases. Well, what is an index uh, histogram? Well, it's not a gluten-free, keto-friendly biscuit. It's actually a representation of your data. Uh, someone out went out and measured the height of 10,000 US females and plotted them on a bar chart as you see here. And you can kind of see um, the folks around 145 and 150, well, 140, 150, 155, I'm guessing 160, 165, 170, 180, and 185. So you kind of get a representation of what's out there. Think of these uh, blue lines going up as buckets. Now, Wikipedia says a histogram is an accurate representation of distribution of numerical data. Uh, it usually uses for numerical data. And for a relational database, it's an approximation of the data distribution within a column. Now, the optimizer assumes that the information is stored roughly, uh, roughly evenly distributed, but that may not be true. And by actually having a true representation, the optimizer can actually find the stuff that it needs to do much faster. So we have two types of histograms, and I consider them both buckets. Uh, singleton, where you have one value of bucket. Um, uh, say like people whose last names start with A are in one bucket, people whose last names start with B in the second one. Or equihite, where you just kind of say, okay, I have 10 buckets, I'm going to divide up every one uh, equally into those various buckets. And the maximum number of buckets you can have is 1,024. Now, histograms are really useful for non-index columns. So if you have data that's not really churning a whole lot, um, or not at all, uh, histograms are great. Uh, there's um, you can create them on demand, so if you're updating that data, you can go out and recreate the histogram, and there's no overhead. Now, on indexes, every time you do an insert, update, or delete, uh, that's overhead. So you have the table that you're updating, and then you have the index that you're updating, so it's kind of like doing the same work uh, in a different scale twice. And uh, this, this overhead can be significant on very, very busy systems. And Occasionally, the optimizer to check the statistics will do index dives to estimate um, the number of records in a given range, and also does some, some uh, balancing of the information. So it wants to go through and rebuild the statistics. So histograms, you don't have that overhead. Now, the optimizer uh, occasionally find, fails to find the most efficient plan and ends up spending a lot of time, uh, more than assessment, trying to figure out the, what's going on. As I mentioned earlier, the optimizer assumes the data is evenly distributed in a column, which often is not the case. Uh, the old, you know, assume makes an ass out of you and me joke is brought to life. So the main reason that the optimizer doesn't have enough knowledge about the data is um, has to figure out how many rows are in the table, how many distinct values are there in each column, and how is the di data distributed, and histograms are great for that. As I mentioned earlier, we have two types, uh, equi-height, one bucket represents a range of values. Uh, so like we're arranging um, things by their name A to G, another bucket for H to L, another one for M to T, another one for U to Z. Uh, singleton, where one bucket represents a single value. I've got a good example of that coming up. Okay, let's do a fr frequency histogram. We have three buckets for possible values, 101, 102, and 104. And into that table, we have two 101s, three 102s, and one 104. So if we select from that table, here's our two 101s, our three 102s, and our one 104. And uh, if we analyze the table and create a histogram with three buckets, uh, you'll see the information over here. Now the histogram information is uh, stored out in our information schema, which is uh, metadata about your, your data. And we actually know now if we look at the, the distribution of our buckets, uh, by the way, singleton, uh, we have three buckets, one for 101, which control, which has one third of the data. Uh, 102 inclusively has, uh, if you include 101 and 102, you have 83% of the data. And if you have 104 and you can include that in your search, you've got 100% of the data. So this actually can be used by the optimizer to, uh, to give you better performance estimates of how the data is gonna be collected. Now, if you want to see this in a cumulative frequency, uh, we know that if we get the values for 101, we're getting 33 and a third percent of our, our data. 
Uh, if we go for, for 102, we know it's half our data, but if you include that with 102, you know that we have 83% of our data. And uh, 104, you have 100% of the data, even though it's only 16% of the overall data. Uh, as the optimizer goes out to figure out ranges of searches, it uses this information from the histogram to make it a little more educated guess on how to go out and grab your data. Uh, histograms are easy to create. Uh, analyze table, update histogram. On um, this case, we're doing uh, table T. We're going to have histograms on column one, column two, column three, each with 10 buckets. Uh, we've done some, make some changes to our data. We update the histograms on column one and column two, or column three, and we can drop the histogram on C2. More information about histograms, uh, you can go out to the information schema on the column statistics and it will tell you uh, the column names you have with histograms, uh, the type of data that's being uh, in the histogram, and the bucket count. Now this is an example where histograms really shine. We're going to create a simple table it's called H1. It has an ID that's an integer, unsigned, auto increment. And then we have a column named x, int, unsigned, and uh, that's where we're going to store our data. And our primary key is id. We insert into h1 values uh, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3. And if we go out and do a simple select x and count x and group it by x, you'll see that we have our two ones, or three twos, and four threes. So that's just the raw data without the histogram. So now we're going to go out through and do a select star from H1 where X is greater than zero. Now the optimizer uh, knows that there's nine rows in the table and it guesses to that to find all the values greater than zero that it's going to have to read 33% of the or yeah 33 percent of the of the columns to get your information. Now we know all our values are greater than zero optimizer doesn't know that. Uh, we've seen the data, the optimizer really hasn't paid attention to the data yet. So this is telling us it's going to read 33% uh, of our nine rows or, or three rows. Uh, kind of like when you get someone give you an estimate on re-plumbing your bathroom, uh, the, 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 that's a way low ballpark figure. Now the filtered column that I'm using here is a estimated percentage and the estimate has to come from of the statistics. In this case, the optimizer is not getting good data. So, alter table H1, update histogram on X with three buckets. It goes up, creates that for us. Now this time, when we run the same query, it knows that all the values of X are greater than zero, and it tells us um, it knows all where all the data is, and it's telling us that we're going to have to uh, read 100% of them to get, to get all that information we want. Now, if we run this with explain analyze, uh, it gives us more information and it tells us uh, the cost, the number of rows, and the actual time. Now, performance is not just indexes and histograms. There's a lot of other uh, things that can go in there and um, don't really have time to go into those. Now, you can use explain to do other things to see what your, your query is doing. Uh, file sorts, full table scans, uh, temporary tables. Uh, also, you get a feeling over time, do the join, does the join order that the optimizer has to do look right? Um, your configuration for your buffers and your caches. Um, do you have enough memory? And of course, your disk and dislike things are the speeds uh, fast enough. Now, I'm going to skip through locking options and a whole bunch of other stuff um, just because of time. Don't have a lot of time uh, today to talk to you all. I wish I had more. Hopefully next year we'll be in person and I can give this again go through in more detail. So uh, too much content. So go out to slideshare.net slash Dave Stokes. Look for Open Source 101 and you'll see the full details of this. So we're, gonna sk we're skipping over uh, about 30 slides. So where else do you get information? Well, for uh, explain and performance tuning and all that, I uh, really recommend the MySQL manual. It is a fairly easy read. It explains things very well. Also, I recommend going to forums.mysql.com. I forget how many sub forums we have out there, but it's a good place. Our engineers uh, are frequently out there. Now, mysqlcommunity.slack.com, I highly recommend that. Our engineers uh, 
observe that on a regular basis and you're going to get a a very good answer to any question you have fairly quickly. I really, really recommend that. And uh, welcome to the MySQL community, by the way. Please join our Slack channel. Also, two fairly new books. Um, Query Performance Tuning came out about six months ago. MySQL Concurrency came out uh, two months ago. Uh, if you're serious about learning to get your MySQL queries better, you need both these books. Um, Jesper Wisborg Crow is a friend and he is an amazing author. Uh, he does great um, examples, very easy to read books, and amazing detail. Um, I'm on my third reading of concurrency and fifth reading of performance tuning, and I'm learning something every time. Uh, many of you might have a copy of High Performance MySQL. Make sure you're getting the third edition. Uh, supposedly there's a fourth edition in the works, but I can't really give you any more details, and I've heard that it's in uh, the works without the original authors. Now, if you're using JSON, I highly recommend my book, uh, MySQL, J MySQL and JSON, a Practical Programming Guide. The second edition came out. Uh, lots of examples, best practices, uh, over twice the length of the original. And if you want to use the MySQL document store, this is a great guide to getting into it. Uh, JSON in relational databases is a totally different animal and uh, very practical, very handy. Now, if you are a startup, I highly recommend going out to oracle.com slash startup. Uh, they have a program there that gives you credits, uh, advice, uh, exposure, um, do some marketing for you. And a uh, very interesting program, but you do have to be a startup. And with that, I want to thank you. Um, if you need to get a hold of me, um, david.stokes at oracle.com at stoker. I have a blog at elephantdolphin.blogspot.com. Uh, also, our blog aggregation for the MySQL community is planet.myskill.com. Uh, once again, if you have questions, forums.myskill.com and myskillcommunity.slack.com. And once again, the slides for this, um, actually the full version of this presentation are going to be on SlideShare and at us, Dave Stokes. Thank you very much, and we're off to the Q&A.